For thousands of years, the changing tides of the world's oceans were a mystery. Twice a day, the oceans would rise, and twice a day, they would recede. Thanks to the great thinkers of the past and the present, the world's tides are no longer a secret. I'm Danielle with Explore Ocean. The word tide comes from a generic term used to define the alternating rise and fall in sea level with respect to the land, produced by the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. To a much smaller extent, tides also occur in large lakes, the atmosphere, and within the solid crust of the Earth, acted upon by the same gravitational forces of the moon and the sun. In 1687, Isaac Newton used his Law of Universal Gravitation to explain that the ocean's tides were a result of the gravitational attraction of the sun and the moon. The gravitational attraction of the moon, known as tractive force, causes the oceans to bulge out in the direction of the moon. Another bulge occurs on the opposite side, since the Earth is also being pulled towards the moon and away from the water and its inertia on the far side. These two bulges are high tides, and the low areas are low tides that occur as the Earth rotates in relation to the moon. The sun also affects the oceans in the same way, but with a little less than half the gravitational force of the moon, because the sun is so much farther away from the Earth. When the sun and the moon are in line with the Earth, as they are during a full moon and a new moon, then the effects stack up on each other to make for a very high and low tides. These very high tides are known as spring tides. The use of the word spring here doesn't have any relation to the season of spring. It's more of a reference to the abundance of water, like a mountain spring. When the sun is crossways to the earth and the moon, as it is during a quarter moon phase, then the effects tend to cancel each other out to a large extent, making for relatively small tidal swings. These minimal tides are known as neap tides. There are several other factors that can affect how the tides will work in a certain area, including the depth and shape of the ocean floor, the shape of the coastline, weather conditions, even other planets can have a very small effect on the tides. As the tide proceeds in what is known as ebb tide, it leaves behind shallow pools of water, appropriately called tide pools. Tide pools are very interesting, as they can be full of all kinds of different marine life. Michelle Clementi is a marine protection and education supervisor for Newport Beach. Michelle, thanks for helping us learn about the tide pools. You're welcome. The tide pools are really a fascinating place. They're one of the, the closest places where people can actually get in touch with wildlife. Um, what is so special about the tide pools is that most of the animals that live in the tide pools are subjected to periods of being underwater, periods of being out in the sun, they're subjected to wave action, and they're also subjected to human activity. So I've noticed that the higher parts of the pools are different from the lower parts. Yeah, you can tell what animals you're going to find by the different zones within the tide pools. So the upper zone that's closest to the sandy beach area is actually called the splash zone. And in the splash zone, the animals are rarely exposed to water. They're, they're actually dry most of the time. Then you would move to the high zone where animals are sometimes underwater but exposed frequently. And then you go to the mid-tide zone, which is actually my favorite, that I think that's the most fun to explore, where the animals are half and half exposed and underwater. And then there's the low zone, where the animals are primarily underwater almost all of the time, where you'll find more of your fishes and, and the kelp and things like that. Michelle, since we're talking about how special the sea life is, how should it be treated? Well, there are a number of laws that protect this area um, and classify it as special. We have, we have laws for, for the rocky intertidal area as well as the marine mammals and, and the water that we have here at the beach. But for the most part, what we try to do is encourage people to come explore all you want, look all you want, take as many pictures as you want. Um, but we really want to have people have good tide pooler etiquette, which is try not to turn over the rocks, try to stay on dry dry rocks, because um, you don't know what's living underneath the rock that you're standing on. Um, and, and, and be kind. These, these are animals that have to live here. They have a lot of things that they have to put up with. And so we all remember that we have to share the beach with them and, and be responsible. Um, we can ha all have a great time. We're here at Explore Ocean Newport Harbor Nautical Museum's Touch Tank. 
Michelle, you had a big part in making this tank happen. Do you want to tell us about it? Sure. Uh, animal ambassadors are really important in helping people learn about the environment. So here you can come to Explore Ocean and you can get to know some of our tide pool stars up close and personal. Like here we have a sea hare. Oh, it's a slug. It feels a little slimy. <laughs> But they really are—they really are an important part of the tide pools because they—they um, they eat algae and they keep things in balance. So while they might be a little squishy, they are very important to the tide pools. This is an ochre star, and the sea stars and the sea urchins are actually related. They're called echinoderms, which means spine skin. And you can see little spines on the star, and you can see the spines on the urchin, of course. Well, Michelle, this touch tank seems like a great way to help us understand ocean conservation and help educate and inspire people of all ages to explore the ocean, Earth's last great frontier.